Welcome to Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. Planting the seed of truth and growing families in the Word of God. We've been studying 2 Timothy chapter 3. I'm going to try to wrap it up today if possible. So just jump right in there. And if you got your, um, your notes from previous weeks, you know that we've been using the Renner International Version, which gives a lot of the meanings of the Greek words so that we really understand what he's trying to get across to us here. The Apostle Paul is writing Timothy, and he's telling him, Ahead of time, just as God warned Noah of things that were to come that weren't yet seen, and Noah built the ark according to God's instruction, never having seen rain like this, <laughs> he built the ark according to God's instruction. Why? For the saving of his household. God warned him, this is coming, build the ark this way. Second Timothy chapter 3 is our blueprint for our ark for our families. Whether you're a family of one or a family of ten, doesn't matter. This is God's instruction. This is coming. Build your ark and your family will rise above it. Okay? So that's where we've been. I'll catch you up on 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse, verse 1, the first part. He says, you, you emphatically need to know with unquestionable certainty that in the very end of days, anybody here think we might be at the last of the last days, King James Version says, when time is sailed to its last port and no more time remains for the journey, the last season will stand in the midst of uncontrollable, unpredictable, hurtful, treacherous, menacing times that will be emotionally difficult for people to bear. And from there, he starts giving the characteristics of society in the last the last days. Chris, you and I kind of talked a little bit about this the other day. Um, this shouldn't be a big surprise to us the way the world is. God gave us this information so that, not to scare us, but to prepare us and how we can protect our homes to rise above today's culture and live literally in a different realm. You, you're living in a different realm. Things that are tearing people up out there, you've got the blueprint to build the ark to rise above those things. And it's not just for you. They're going to see it and they're going to want in. They're going to want the peace that you have and the love that your family maintains even through rough times. And when I look around this room and I see family after family who have been through stuff, right? With, with marriages, with loss, with, with their children. But yet, the word has not only sustained them but brought them out. Just story after story fills this room. And, and that's what we've got to focus on. God is giving us the ability to prepare for today's culture and to have our household ready so that, so that we can stand. So we've covered, number one was lovers of their own selves. We've already covered that one. Covetousness, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, Truce breakers and false accusers. We've covered all of those in weeks before, okay? So we don't have time to cover those again. We're going to pick up with number 12, which is incontinent. Now, the Renner version says it this way. People will generally lose the ability to say no, and they will be unable to control their instincts in nearly every area of their life. Incontinent, out of control. People in today's culture, without the Lord, without making the word the final authority, without it directing them, they will get to a place where they can't say no. They're unable to control their own instincts. I love something Adam Clark's commentary says about this. He says, those who having sinned away their power of self-government. People can't govern themselves anymore, so guess who's going to? The government. If you cannot control yourself, something or someone else will control you. We, we have a culture out there that is not responsible for themselves. 
Things make them mad. Things make them respond a certain way. And, and everything is from an outside pressure influencing their actions. And watch for this in your children. And when you see it, correct it. I, I, tell, I tell my grands all the time, that made me mad. She made me mad. That made me mad. No. They gave you the opportunity to be mad, and you took it. See, there's a huge difference and a godly principle. Look, the godly life, John and I say this a lot, is a disciplined life. The Christian walk is a disciplined walk. It's self-discipline. I'm not going to stand up here and make you do it. I'm not going to say, don't wear this and don't wear that. You need to do this. You've got to, I'll, I'll preach the word to you. I'll tell you what the scripture says. And then you self-govern. You, what a beautiful part of Christianity. He gave mankind self-will, and he gave us the ability to govern ourselves. But the incontinent, that will be people who have lost the ability to say no. And I love Adam Clark's, they have sinned away their power of self-government. They have ignored the word, ignored God's instruction, ignored what the scripture tells them to do. They've ignored it, they've ignored it, they've ignored it. And now they have lost the ability to govern themselves. Proverbs 29, 29, 18 says that where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. Study it. That's what it means. Where there is no vision, the people are unrestrained. So how in building our homes, in, in raising our children, how do we keep them from falling into this mindset, into this culture of not controlling themselves. First of all, example. Nothing better than example. But we have to, you hear a lot in the business world and in church world about casting the vision. Parents, you have to cast the vision, God's vision for your home, for your children. You have to be the ultimate business person in casting that vision to your children. God has given your family a destiny. He has given them a destination. He has a call and a purpose for your home. Whether that's one or ten, he's given you a call, and that is to be a light in this world. So we're going to govern ourselves to fulfill that calling. Well, we're not going to do that. This is why. We're not going to act that way. You're not going to talk back to that umpire because he's a figure of authority. If he is wrong... We won't hire him back to do another game. But he made that call. He's in authority. And I know it's hard, parents, because you want to get out there and argue the call. I, Grandma, I mean, I've got flag football. That's serious business. And, I, and you want to get out there and argue the call. But we're teaching them something. And it has to do with this right here, with every single action that we take. We've got to cast the vision. This family has a purpose. It's to be a light to this world. Therefore, we're not going to go there. We're not going to do that. I know you might not partake of that, or you, but we're going to live this way because we have to be the ultimate vision casters. Life in the Christian home is to be self-governed by the Word of God. And the ultimate, and, and I hats off to Mary and, and Bob and Charlotte and some other parents that I've watched do this way better than I did. The ultimate of this is to look at your kids when they do bring up a question. And I believe, Mary, you're probably the one that taught me this, that you would answer them with a question. Why shouldn't you go? Or why should you go? And let them answer their own question. Mom, can I go? Well, if you say no, they're going to have an argument. If you say yes, you might not should have. So the ultimate is to teach them the process of thought. Why should you go? And why shouldn't you go? And then come back and tell me. What are you teaching them? You're teaching them a process of thinking that will keep them safe in this culture. Why should I? Why shouldn't I? According to the Word of God, if you need to help them find Scripture, help them find Scripture, then they answer. You know, Jesus taught that way. He didn't just answer people. He asked them a question when they asked him a question. They asked him a question, he, he asked them a question. 
and you can't rebel against your own answer. It's a great way to parent. I wish I'd have known it about 33 years ago. Our children need to see the vision so they understand any restraint. It will give them understanding. And where do you or your family have an issue saying no? Where have you lost self-government and address that? All right. The next part, 2 Timothy chapter 3, Renner version. People will become savage. This is number 13. The King James Version says fierce. People will become fierce. Man, have I seen this change in the last five years. I mean, yes, in biblical days, they had the call of Sims and Christians were being burned at the stake. And I mean, horrible things were happening. But there is a fierceness across the board, even within the Christian culture. A fierceness. It means uncivilized, harsh, and an enjoyment of cruelty. And we have to, in our homes, we have to ask ourselves, what have we gotten comfortable with that should turn our stomach and turn the power button on the television? That should take that game out of that video game. I don't even know what you call them anymore. They, up, they come out with something new every other year, don't they? That should make us take that game and trash it, even though our kid likes to play it. Because what are we getting comfortable with in our homes that is an abomination to God? Cruelty. I I thought, and I know I've probably covered this every time we teach 2 Timothy chapter 3. But I wonder how many murders our children see take place on video games, songs, and television by the time they're adults. How many murders? Pay attention this week. When you see a murder on television, make you a little hash mark. When you see a rape, we've gotten so accustomed to watching rape on television. What have we gotten comfortable with that we need to tighten back up? And I'm not going to stand up here and tell you, you can't have television. It's a sin to have. I'm telling you that when we allow things into our eye gates, our ear gates, in our homes, we're opening ourselves up to getting comfortable with things. And once we get comfortable with things, we accept things. Tolerance is not a godly word. That's a worldly word. It's not a godly word. And and there are some things that we should never get comfortable with. Colossians 3 tells us to clothe ourselves with compassion and to put on love. And that love would be what binds us together in perfect unity. Where's our unity problem? Because we're not putting on compassion and, and love. There's a fierceness, there's a thread of fierceness woven into our culture and we're allowing it into our homes and we've got to shut the door to that. He continues, 2 Timothy chapter 3, it will eventually feel like there are no laws to protect the innocent. Anybody ever felt that in the last couple of years? Like there were laws being made that, that were that were literally made to not protect the innocent? It's a total flip. I mean, I realize I'm 54. So I've seen a span of things, right, John? You feel me, right? I believe we were born the same year. We, We used to see laws made to protect the innocent, and now we're seeing laws made that don't protect the innocent. That's a sign of the last days. So number 14 is despisers of those that are good. King James Version says despisers of those that are good. Isaiah 5.20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and clever in their own sight. We've covered this before. God is God. There is none other. 
His word is final authority. We don't argue his word. When he says it, he says it for a reason. He says it because it's right. He says it's because it's truth. He says it to protect us. And there is an evil agenda. And don't go putting names on that. Put it back to the root of what it is. There is a good God and there is a bad devil. And so we've got to pay attention in these last days. There are going to be those who are despisers. And it's going to be rampant, and it's, it's gotten more rampant, of those who are good. And there'll be a, a fierce intolerance of good. And, and we're already getting there. There are things that are hard for me to cover from the pulpit because I know live stream's going. Because I know, I know tomorrow I could face opposition. I know tomorrow I could have haters waiting for us to get to work. We covered some things in the weeks before, I think it was two weeks ago, we covered some things where we could really face some, some opposition. We try to cover everything in love, but we're not going to back down from the truth. We're going to speak it in love. Because it is for everyone's good. God made us. He's the designer of us. He knows what's right. John 3 tells us why, why there's going to be a hatred of good. And that's because darkness hates light. Now, granted, we can do a better job of shining light. It's got to be presented from a heart of love. And I think we said this two weeks ago, but I have found the best answer for me to give sometimes is just Scripture. It's what God's Word says. Romans. You know, this is what God said. This is what God said. And then they want to argue with God, they can argue with God. But if we do it from a caring standpoint, we can get away with saying a lot more. Okay? So despisers of those who are good. How do we not compromise under pressure? How do we teach our children as this opposition comes against what is good? How do we teach our children not to compromise under that kind of pressure? Because there is that kind of pressure. Business owners, there's that kind of pressure. Churches, there's that kind of pressure. You know, at school, there's that kind of pressure to conform to this world and when the scripture tells us not to conform to it, not to be patterned like it, not to look like it, how do we teach our children not to compromise under that? And we ourselves, let's face it, I have to deal with it from up here. That thought comes, if you say that, you could face, you know, and y'all can sit back there and cheer me on and yes, you know, preach it. And I'm so glad you cover that, but I'm telling you, I still have the thought that Channel 4, Channel 11, and whoever else could be sitting out there in the morning. And you would be at home or at work. I would be the one walking in here, right? So how do we not fold under, under that, and how do we teach our children not to? I'm going to give you a list of scriptures that those of you who are studying this, thank God we have studiers, can take note of. I think, once again, the vision of who we are in Christ and what our purpose is has got to be greater than the pressure. So we have to constantly keep our assignment from God uh, in front of us. But Galatians 1.10, Acts 5.29, John 12.43, and 1 Thessalonians 2.4, there's more. But all of these speak of pleasing God and not man. And that's the kind of heart that we have to raise up in the next generation. It amazes me the strong wills of the children of this generation. And Tanya and I have talked about it often. Both of our granddaughters are very strong women at ages five and four. Very strong women. And we believe it's for a reason. We believe this next generation is going to have to have very strong wills to not fold under compromise, the pressure of compromise. So we've got to teach them it's all about pleasing God and not pleasing man. And there's great examples. Daniel, I mean, take them to Daniel in the lion's den. Hey, they came under the, he came under this kind of pressure, but yet he did not. 
He continued to pray as he always prayed. Uh, the, th the three Hebrew children thrown in the fiery furnace, they did not fold. They stayed with what God told them to do. God protected every single one of those individuals. And we can teach them those Bible accounts or Bible stories, if you will, and, and help them see what strength will do. Esther, I mean, there's just multiple ones that you can talk about. The truth is good used to be applauded. Is my household prepared for when it's not? Because, you know, we've got a generation that's all about, well, this new generation is not so much Facebook, but us older ones, it's all about the likes. What I have to do to get the likes. We need to lose that mentality in our homes. What's right, not what's liked. All right, you ready for the next one? Number 15, traitors. Renner's version says people will find it easy to walk away from commitments and to easily throw away relationships. I'm talking about across the board, traitors. The big word here for me in the definition is betrayal. To be betrayed. People will betray and, and be betrayed. There's an unfaithfulness and, and there's an abandoning. People abandon people when things get tough. People abandon the church when things get tough. Come on, church. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And that is supposed to be the people of God. That's Proverbs 18, 24. There's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. And in the Christian home, we should find faithfulness. Faithfulness. I like the word loyalty. And you know what? If you have to part ways... Part ways right. Part ways right. Don't just disappear off your job. You know, where, where dad lives, we've been dealing with, with them a lot here lately. And, and we've discovered is they have trouble just getting people to show up when it's their shift. And you can go through town and you can see that's a common issue right now. And people have a job, they sign their name on the dotted line and they write their name on the back of the check when they get paid. And then they just don't show up. They're traitors. They're unfaithful. Hey, we covered this two weeks ago. When you sign your children up for softball, for t-ball, for flag football, they're going to play out that season whether they like it or not. They're going to because you're teaching them a principle that is going to carry through every... They can sit on the bench. They can sit on the sideline. That's great. But you said you wanted to play. Mom and Daddy went and bought you $300 worth of equipment. We have gone to practices. We have sat in 105 degree temperatures. These other team players are depending on you to be there. They can't even play. They have to forfeit if you're not there. You're going to get your hind end out there and play. That doesn't have anything to do with the Bible. Oh, yes, it does. Traitors. Moving along. Chris, sometimes I'm not popular. I never got voted homecoming queen. Number 16, heady. H-E-A-D-Y. The renter version says they will become reckless, impulsive, and known for their enjoyment of violence. There, there's an, there is a violent aspect to this recklessness. And it's, it's basically whatever comes to their head. Heady. Whatever comes to their head. Just an impulsive reaction. Proverbs 19.2, I love this scripture. It says, it's not good to have zeal without knowledge. And we got a whole lot of zeal out there in culture right now. I'm going to call it stupid zeal. Stupid zeal. Like there's just an impulse to do something. Can I be real plain and hope that Channel 4 doesn't show up tomorrow? I'm calling y'all if they do, okay? Well, just make a circle around me. I am against racial, racial injustice. My friends, my goddaughter will tell you but when there's a verdict that we don't like, when the judicial system is wrong or right, 
We are not going to let impulse cause us to sin. That's heady. Just react. No, let's do something. Let's do something in the proper way. Let's fight issues, political issues that we all care about. Let's fight them in the right way. Right? Instead of being heady, we have a a culture right now who just wants to impulse. You don't fix things that way. You make them worse. And, And abortion, the same thing. I'm not for abortion. I am for life. I can't help but be for anything that's life. But I am not going to go bomb some doctor's office because I'm pro-life. I'm going to vote. I'm going to support. You know, we can't be heady. It's not good to have zeal without knowledge. Nor to be hasty and miss the way. Don't you love that part of that? To be hasty and miss the way. You're missing the point. You're missing the right way just to have a way, to have your way, and that's not right. It goes on, it says, a man's own folly ruins his life, yet his heart rages against the Lord. He gets mad at God for it, but it's his own folly. Our decision processes are dependent on our knowledge. Mine needs to be knowledge of the Word of God on issues. Any issue needs to be the knowledge of the Word of God. I I encourage you, we've done this before, but I encourage you to read Proverbs several times a year. And if your children are of age, I encourage you to have them memorize it. The book of Proverbs, they can remember that song. How many songs can your children remember? How many songs do they know words to? Can they not? Yes, they can. And it'll be life to those that find it. It is full of knowledge. It is the book of knowledge. And we need to be reading it, putting that in us, so that our decision processes are based on that. We have to learn. There's a lot of pressure to respond quickly. Just go look up the word hasty in the Bible. Rash. Google it. Scripture is about being hasty, making quick decisions. And you'll find every single time it is not a positive scripture about that. So when this pressure comes to respond quickly, Christians, listen to me, take a step back. You don't have to respond quickly. And just because things are thrown at you quickly doesn't mean you have to respond back quickly. You need to teach your kids that. Well, what do you feel about such and such? I'll get right back to you on that. Email me that question. I'll email you back. There's some wisdom that we're going to have to use in the last days because we've got to learn to deal with that quick pressure. Let's think about this. Let's pray about this. What does the Word say? It's what you need to teach your kids. It's what we need to be saying to our mates. Let's pray about this. Let's think about this. What does the Word say? And that'll help us make that decision correctly. Number 17, high-minded. Renner's version says they'll become full of pride and inflated with a sense of their own self-importance. High-minded. It's uh, people that are full of themselves, self-delusional, haughty, and I love this one, critical spirit. And I don't know about y'all, I have to work on that one. And I have to recognize that when I've got a critical spirit, I'm being high-minded. So when my kids, my grandkids, when your household is getting a critical spirit, let's stop and let's see that red flag. Are we being high-minded? Are are we being high-minded? Literally, this word in the Greek means, high-minded means to envelop in smoke. So it's the, things are clouded. When you're high-minded. We've got to keep ourselves in front of the mirror of the word in order to see the truth. In order to see ourselves correctly. Because the mirror of the word won't let us live a lie. All through this study of 2 Timothy chapter 3, it has shown me the truth. And it's shown me where I, where I need to grow. 
and what I need to work on and what I need to change. It will not let me live a lie if I keep my nose in front of this book. 1 Corinthians 15, 10 says, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace to me was not without effect. His word's supposed to be affecting who I am. That's what that means. It was not without effect. No, I worked harder than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God that was within me. That was the apostle saying that. I, by the grace of God, I am what I am. And that grace was not without effect. It should be affecting how we see ourselves and, and how we see other people. I'm going to have to speed up. Renner version. To the extent that it may end up, this is going to be, all of these things are going to come on society to the, to the extent that it may end up feeling like society is being hit by a typhoon. Have you not seen the snowball of all of these things that have always existed just being amplified in the last five, six years? He goes on, Apostle goes on, he says, However, those menacing winds of change will eventually blow out like a storm that comes and goes. Meanwhile, people will become fixated on the unobtainable pursuit of happiness and pleasure even more than they love God. And that brings us to number 18. People will become lover of pleasures more than lovers of God. I find that interesting because it doesn't mean that they're not lovers of God. It just means that they're lovers of pleasures more than they're lovers of God. Matthew 6 is real plain. If you seek first the kingdom, all these things that the world is chasing after will be added to you. Added to you. Seek first the kingdom and all these things that it talks about the Gentiles and the world crave. It literally, that word means crave and long after and are running after. All of those things will just be added to you. How many have seen that in their life? Yes. All those things we, we were striving for and, and going after, if we seek first the kingdom, there they are. There they are. They're added to us, and then they're not controlling us. People are worn out from chasing happiness. They're literally worn out from chasing happiness. You know you can't catch ha happy? You can't. You never catch up with it. It'll always be that carrot that's so far out there in front of you. That's why God gave us joy. Because joy remains even when happiness does not exist. Joy. He gave us joy. It's a fruit of the Spirit. It's a, it's a, it's a byproduct. It's what is produced when we follow after the Spirit, not after the flesh. We've got to be careful with this one because we are a pleasure-loving society. Okay, I'm going to go there. Since I'm so popular today. See if I get invited to anybody's tailgate. I know where I could go. <laughs> Church. Churches feel that they have to present, advertise, manipulate, beg, shame people to get them to church on Sundays anymore. When I was growing up, you didn't ask if you could stay home from church. Well, you could. My daddy didn't have to answer me. He could look at me. <laughs> there was no, I would rather be out doing this. It was, this is where we need to be. As a family, this is where we need to be. And you know what? My wise daddy knew something. He knew something, and he grew something in me that made me value. And I'm not just talking about four walls. I know the new thing now is churches. The church has left the building. Yes, there is a church in a building. 
Well, we can go out under oak tree if you want to, but in 100 degrees, you're going to be thankful for these padded pews and this air conditioning. The point is this. The church is a part of who Jesus Christ is. He is the head of the church. The book of Revelation, you go there. Jesus was walking in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks, which are the churches. I don't, like, I don't want to beat you all over the head with it, but I don't want to deny the truth. I have never, not once, had parents come to me and say, give anything if I had not brought my child up in youth group. I've, I've, I have been in this church since I was 10 years old. I have sat in the office and heard many, many family councils. Never, not once, has it been because they raised their children in church. Can someone like the youth pastor give me a good amen right there? Never have I had people come to me and say, I can't believe I brought my, my kids to that children's church where they learn to, to pray for people, where they, they learn to stand on the Word, where they learn memory verses. Brett, you were one of those kids. And you know something from that. You learned something to raise your own kids on. Is that, can I leave that now? Lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. Now, if you want to go and play golf on a Sunday, I don't care. Go have fun. Take your family to the beach. Right, wives? Take your family to the beach. <laughs> Take them to Branson. Take them shopping. On a Sunday, I realize a lot of you, that's, some of you, that's the only day you have off. But habitually... Show your family the importance of God. Thanks. Although, Renner version, although they may possess an outward form of religion, they will rebuff, refute, refuse, and reject the authentic power that goes along with genuine godliness. King James Version says it this way. They'll have a form of godliness, but they will deny its power. What is the gospel's power? What is the power of the gospel? It's to change us. Salvation. That's right. Our salvation. Save our lives. Not just from hell, but save our lives. Even right here where we live on this earth, save our lives. What this literally means is that, is that people in this culture will have a flexible truth. They don't like absolute truth. But they'll have a flexible truth. They'll have a form of godliness. A form of godliness, but they will deny its power to change them. Their own form of spirituality that is comfortable for them. But it has not the power to change them because they change it to fit them instead of them to fit it. The word is to transform us, right? Romans 12, don't be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your that you may prove what is the acceptable, good, and perfect will of God. That's what we're doing. We're saying no to that mold that we're trying to be pressed into. We're going to the Word and we're saying, yes, press me into that. That's what I want to be right there. Romans 8, 29 tells us that we're to be molded into the image of Christ. And if, if, if there's something in my world, uh, pressure from culture that's, that's trying to form me into anything else, then I have to resist that. I have to let the gospel do its work. That's what we're doing this morning. We're letting the gospel do its work. You know what gospel means? 
It's good news. This is good news. It can change me. It can shape me into the image of Christ. So if we're not changing more and more into his image, somewhere we're denying the power of the word. Right? Back to Renner's version, 2 Timothy 3. I urgently tell you, mentally, spiritually, and physically, turn away and remove yourselves from such people. Now, that's really not popular in today's church culture. I love the Apostle Paul because he just really didn't care. He was there to preach the word. He was there to say what God, the revelation that God gave him. And if people liked it, didn't like it, threw him in prison. He just kept telling the truth. And he loved people and people, the people that wanted the truth loved him. And he said, I'm urgently telling you that these people who have a form of godliness but deny the power thereof, mentally, spiritually, physically turn away and remove yourselves from such people. These sorts of people project themselves whew, as help with the intention of gaining access into people's homes to manipulate them. All right, church, we've been talking about home for five weeks. Five weeks. The target is your home. The target is your home. All of this he's just talked about. He's coming down to this. These sorts of people project themselves as help. And this word just really stood out to me today. With the intention of gaining access into people's homes to manipulate them. The culprit will come under the disguise, Gary, of help. And, and I, I thought, you know, of course my heart is towards the next generation. Mama... Dad, what are you using in your home to help you parent? Do you hand them a device? Because it makes your parenting easier. When you're sitting in a restaurant, Brett, and they need to learn how to sit and be patient for the food. I know, I know. Well, we don't have to parent and we don't have to learn that lesson if we hand them a device that keeps them busy, keeps them off our nerves. I'm not saying don't ever. I'm just saying let's not fall into a habit of handing them a tablet or a phone when there's a lesson that needs to be learned or you're going to have some teenager throwing a wall-eyed fit because they don't know patience and they don't know, or a person on the job who can't be patient, who can't cope. This culture will have no coping skills. So the church, the families of the church have got to have coping skills. We got to have coping skills. A drug is not a coping skill. It's a killer. So there's things that need to be taught. He's telling us this. And he's letting us know that they're going to come under the guise of help. And they're going to, they're going to gain access into people's homes. Gain access. Gain access. That makes me mad. So when you get home, I want you parents, balcony dwellers that sit close to children's church, go through your house and say, what have I given access to my home? What has gained access into my home? And it doesn't just have to be towards our kids. It can be us. Because I'm real quick to get on social media when I'm bored. Scroll, 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 scroll. Everybody, y'all want a challenge today? If you're on social media, pull up your, your screen that shows you how much time you've spent this week. Did you know it can tell you how many hours you've been on social media per day? Did anybody accept that challenge? Because I, okay, I, I thought I was missing something there for a minute. It's, there's no volunteers. We'll do the draft system if we have to. Everybody turn your phones in when you come into the sanctuary. No, I'm kidding. Because we are missing the point that there are some very sneaky ways that the agenda of the Antichrist is entering our homes. 
It may be you watching too much news. Adults. <laughs> Who and what has access into my home? What's the agenda behind that thing? I'll go back to Renner's version. This one really makes me mad. Man, sometimes the Apostle Paul just went like, oh my goodness, why'd you have to write that? These sorts of people project themselves as help with the intention of gaining access into people's homes to manipulate them, especially targeting... I'll read you the King James Version here in a minute. It's even worse. Especially target, targeting some sincere women who feel overwhelmed by frustrations and disappointing failures in life, whom the manipulators find easier to influence because they have so many unmet longings. <laughs> King James Version, they lead captive, silly women laden with sins, led away with divers' lusts. I know, Ken. Aren't you glad right now you're a male? <laughs> this, this is tough. Renner goes on, he says, These women are endlessly doing their best to gain insight needed to help them navigate life, but they are perpetually unable to come to right conclusions based on the truth. Woman was the target in the garden. What makes us think she's not going to be the target today? Women, you have a better pulse, feel, touch on the pulse of your home than anybody else there. We call it women's intuition. It's something God put in you. You know when something's wrong with a kid, when the kid doesn't know there's something wrong with the kid. We've got to be alert. We've got to be alert. A woman deceived is the equivalent of a security system being turned off. You're there, but you're not a one. We've got to be spiritually on to our families, to our households. And be led by our spirit and not be led away. Did you notice those words? King James Version says, led away. Led away. Led away from what? From the attention of your home. Now I work. I know most of you in here work. But I know some of you who the Holy Spirit got your attention and said, I want you to find a way to work from home because I need you paying attention to your home. Amen. Right? So we're led by our Spirit. If the Spirit leads in that direction, we do it. Because, and, and if we are working outside the home, we have to keep our attention on the home so that we're not led away we're not led away by divers. Lust. lust doesn't just mean sexual sin, although it's what we tend to... It means pressure. Pressures. We're led away. Led away from what? Led away from our home where the manipulators are trying to get. Led away. I don't... It just... When I read that, it just... We got to wake up. The Apostle Paul's telling us exactly what we need to watch for. We can go to the Word. We can see exactly how to build the ark that will protect our families from these things. And I know it may look like 18 things. There's a lot of plates to spin. I can, I can bring it down real simply. God first. Everything in your home, bring it to God. Everything, every question, every answer... Everything, bring it to God. If we do that, we will bring up this next generation who's going to live in a more intense society than we have right now. They won't fall to it. They'll rise above it and they'll bring people with them. They're going to have something that the world can't find anywhere else. Amen? We're going to start it now. Right? Start it now. Y'all can stand. This has been Living Faith from the Russellville Christian Center. We pray that this message has uplifted, encouraged, and motivated you today. You can find us online at rccenter.org or visit us at 305 Lakefront Drive, Russellville, Arkansas.